So, quick show of hands. How many here were born after 1960? <coughs> Most of us. Well, the sad news is that, according to CIUK <coughs> statistics, half uh, of people born after 1960 in the UK will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lives. It's quite a strong statistic. So some good news to counterpart that one. So we know that people uh, that are diagnosed with cancer today, will half of these people will live longer, survive longer than five years post-diagnosis, which is incredible because in the 70s that was less than 25%. We also have uh, now better drugs, cleverer drugs. We understand cancer better than ever before. And we also have technologies that allows us to look at cancer at the molecular level. So at the level of the cell, at the level of the molecule. This all been, has been ushered by a revolution in biology and biomedicine. And the story I'm telling you today is basically the story of some of the uh, key player in that revolution. This is Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks, in 1951, was driven by her husband in January uh, to see Dr. Howard Jones at the John, John Hopkins um, Hospital. Henrietta had complained to her GP, or the equivalent in the States, uh, that she had pain during intercourse, she was bleeding between her periods, and she felt, as she described it, a knot in her womb or a knot inside her. The GP saw her, did an observation, and he found that there was a lump of some kind in uh, Henrietta's cervix. He just thought it was a syphilitic wound. I mean, her husband was a bit of a womanizer. So, but he said, let's just go to the hospital, see the specialist just in case. When she was seen by uh, Dr. Uh, Howard Jones, what he observed when he looked at Henrietta's cervix was a mass about the size of a nickel, bright purple, shiny, like grape jello, as he described it, hot, hard, but still so sensitive that when he touched it, it bled. It was a cervical cancer like he's never seen before. And even in his 90s, he was still recalled as a unique, he's never seen anything like it since or before. So, uh, so Henrietta was diagnosed after pathology that she had cervical cancer. She, was, she, undergo, she did go through the therapy of the time, which was for in our, uh, in our eyes partly a little bit barbaric. She had radium rods, radioactive rods, inserted into her vagina, sewn up, and left there for a while to burn off the tumor. She did two cycles of this, and after that, she was exposed to x rays as well, which you know, we still use ionizing radiation to treat cancers today. After this process, the doctors were satisfied that the tumor had disappeared and Henrietta was fine to go home. So she went home, but a bit after that, a few weeks after, was a month, she started feeling ill again. She started bleeding heavily again. And when back, back to doctors, they found out that the cancer had come back and it was spread all over her body. And unfortunately, only nine months or so after her diagnosis, Henrietta died in the hospital. She was 31. This is some cells, some pictures from cells that we grow uh, in my lab and in the labs all over the world. And these cells are Henrietta Lacks. So Henrietta, one thing that I didn't tell you is before she had her treatment, what the doctor did as well is he took a sample from her cervix, part of the normal tissue and a part of the tumor, and sent them off to a lab of his collaborator, Dr. George Guy. So Dr. Guy was a specialist in trying to grow <coughs> cells, human cells in culture outside the body. And what Dr. Guy did is that gave these samples to his technician who, as many times before, she minced them up, put them in a Petri dish, and stick them in a tube with some media for it to grow at what, uh, 37, the same temperature as our bodies. She was not too hopeful. Many times before she had done this, and many times before the cells divided a bit, and then just died. But Henrietta's cells were special. Not only they survived, they thrived. They were doubling in number every 20 hours. They were growing so fast, they had run out of space, they had to develop new techniques how to grow them and maintain them, and these cells, soon enough, started to be spread all over the, the US and then all over the world, sometimes in the pockets of her stewardesses being transported to keep them warm. 
They are now called HeLa cells from Henrietta Lacks, and they are one of the most important tools we've had so far, so these cells and cancer cell lines in general, to study and understand the biology of cancer. The one thing about these cells, they are very special, and they have special characteristics. But before I go into this, I'll tell you a little bit about what is cancer. We all know, I've heard of cancer, we probably can have our own rough definition of what cancer is, but I'll tell you what the one that's roughly agreed within our cancer biology community. Cancer is a group of diseases, it's not one disease, it's a group of diseases that have mostly a genetic origin, and it mostly occurs when cells start dividing pretty fast, they grow abnormally, and then eventually spread to other parts of the body. So they, these cells have to be as very special characteristics to be so aggressive. In the early 2000s, scientists find that there's 10 characteristics or hallmarks of cancer. And these involve things that normally are normal signals that will tell the cells to stop dividing are off, signals that will tell the stop to grow are on, cells can recruit their own blood vessel or tumors, et cetera, et cetera. But one of them, which is really interesting in terms of Henrietta Lacks' cell story, is that these cells become biologically immortal. Now, when I mean immortal, and I, and I mean these cells are immortal. This woman has been dead since 1951. We brought up these cells in my lab from free being frozen at minus 120 in liquid nitrogen, and they grow happily in the dish, given enough food, given enough temperature, given enough space. And they will do that over and over and over again. They are virtually immortal. Of course, if I pour some bleach onto them, they will die. They're not Superman, but they are supercells. Uh, and one of the things that makes them immortal, amongst other complicated biology that I would love to have time to go over, is that they have a slight change compared to the normal cells in our body. Most of the cells in our body can divide only a certain number of times. The reason is that uh, the, the chromosomes in our cells, so the condensed bit of our DNA, have these bits at the end of them called telomeres. And keeping it simple, what these are is they are basically protective blocks at the end of the chromosomes because there's a glitch in biology. Biology isn't perfect. Every time a cell divides, the chromosomes get shorter and shorter and shorter, and these telomeres get eroded. When they run out of telomeres, the cells can't divide anymore, and they stop dividing. And that's what happens when cells become uh, fully differentiated, like a skin cell, a mature skin cell, is not dividing anymore. You have to have new skin cells coming from underneath. And these cells just kind of either divide and then eventually die. In the case of cancer cells, in the case of the HeLa cells, what happens is that there's a special enzyme that can extend these telomeres all the time. So they don't have this barrier anymore. They can keep on dividing over and over and over and over times billions. Now, a couple of facts about HeLa cells. I would claim, hopefully, and a lot of people believe, that they're one of the most important tools in biomedical science that we've had, and other cancer cells as well. If we were to take all HeLa cells that have ever been grown, they would probably account to more than 50 million cubic meters, cubic tons, sorry. And also, they would wrap around the Earth, if they were put side by side, three times. Remember, these things are a tenth of a, cent a, cent a, tenth of a millimeter big. Yeah. Now, I've mentioned that HeLa cells are very important to understand cancer biology because we're able to experiment with them and test hypotheses in them. But there's other, it's not just cancer biology. They also are incredibly useful in the dri uh, driving modern biomedical research. Polio vaccine, very close to just immediately after Henrietta's death, was uh, were investigated using HeLa cells. We were able to, using HeLa cells, to discover techniques to stain and quantify chromosomes. So the fact we know that we have X number of chromosomes is because of techniques developed in HeLa cells. Um, we can also, um, the HeLa cells allowed to develop techniques that allows us to do cloning. So the concept of cloning started with work done in HeLa cells that allows things like Dolly the sheep. And also <laughs> all, all the techniques that allow us to preserve these cells, to change these cells, to manipulate them better. HeLa cells were in the 60s, and again very topical during the Cold War, used to understand the effects of exposure to radiation. So cells were taken by the US government, put on sites of nuclear explosion tests, and look and see what happened to these cells, to test what the effects would be on human cells. They were taken to space. 
They went off on Sputnik, Sputnik 2 alongside some white mice to check what would be the eff effect of zero gravity on human tissue before any man, went up, uh, man or woman went up in space. They also went up in space in the first man-made space journeys began to check the effects parallel to the astronauts. They were used to study virology. Um, the HeLa cells are this aggressive because they they're infected with the virus HPV. And that make, that's one of the things that makes them immortal. And the, I, ask me about the biology of that afterwards. Um, they were also used to initiate studies into HIV infection biology because they changed the HeLa cells in a way that they would be able to infect it with the HIV virus and then study the biology thereon. As I mentioned, they were used to study the biology of immortality in cells, the effect of this enzyme, this telomerase, and this led to Nobel Prize winning research. They were also used to study things like TB infection processes, and finally, in 2013, HeLa cells had their own genome completely sequenced. But it's also, this is also beautifully and fairy tale like research, but it goes with a lot of controversy associated with it. Henrietta Lacks did not consent for her tissue to be taken from her. In that time, particularly for African-American women, or men, uh, it was considered that because they got free care, doctors were more than fine to take tissue from them to experiment on. That's what happened. Her family did not find out that her cells, that she was still alive in a way until the 70s, when a, a relative uh, of a relative went, I work with these cells in the lab, I work with, and they went, with what? With my mother? <laughs> and there's also, there's been, again, during the 50s and the 60s, there were experimentations done in which they thought that, well, what's the way to study cancer? So we've injected these cells into mice and they grew tumors. Let's do that into humans, but how will we do this? Oh, let's ask prisoners. Tell them we're doing a research, cancer research. They'll volunteer. We won't tell them they're injecting them with cancer cells and see what happens. So, yes before ethics and consent and all that was, <laughs> was defined. So it was actually the work done in HeLa cells and all these problems of the work done in HeLa cells build, developed the building blocks for our current ethics procedures that we have to go through to do experiments using human tissue. But there's also another controversial aspect of our HeLa cells. They grow so much and so fast that if put in contact with another cell type, they will take over that culture. They will just overtake it. So there was a lot of work being done and in the 70s, the census went, well, this male prostate cancer cell line has markers for a black African woman. That doesn't make sense. So they actually realized that in a lot of labs, they, when they thought they were experimenting with a specific type of, say, breast cancer, prostate, whatever, they're actually using healers. So that brought in uh, increasing regulation and authentication of cell lines for working scientists so we can actually reproduce each other's work. And for some people, if you're looking at cancer biology, it doesn't really matter which cancer they use. But for some of us, I, I work on breast cancer research. It's very important that I use breast cancer models. Okay? Now, HeLa cells are brilliant. They were a really brilliant tool. But actually, there's hundreds of other very useful cancer cell lines out there and other types of immortalized non-cancer cell lines because we can put telomerase into cells and immortalize them. So these are some pictures from some cells in my lab. Uh, there's breast cancer cell lines, lung, colorectal, brain, all sorts. They were not isolated by me. I did buy them from an authenticated source, so I know what they are. <laughs> and they're incredibly useful models. One thing that I'm very interested in my work is to how these cells, how a tumor can, because it's a three-dimensional structure, how the stresses and processes within a tumor, particularly low oxygen, that's what I'm interested in, how can that change the biology of tumors and drive its ability to spread, and to respond to therapy or not. So what we can do is that we can force these cells to grow in three dimensions. We can make little spheres of cells, steroids, and we can check in these, how do they differ from the cells that grow in a Petri dish? Because plastic is not really reproducing anything we have in the human body. We can put these spheres into matrices, so gel gelatins, and see how these cells can spread into the gelatin. Again, modeling metastatic process, the process in which cells spread to other organs. We can change this, we can use bone as well as a matrix. It's really, really cool. But again, these are still relatively simple models. It's still one cell line from one patient that died 50 odd years ago. What we really need to is go beyond the cancer cell line now, and there's a lot of uh, thrust in the field to do this. 
And the way we're going to do this is by using, going back to the patient, but back to the individual patient. This is just a diagram, it's just some tissue from breast cancer patients, different patients. And you can see they all look very, very different. They're stained for a particular protein, it doesn't really matter now what. They all look very different because all tumors are very different. Even within the same tumor type, they behave differently, they respond differently to therapy, they spread differently. So it's important to go back to the patient and take samples from the patient. And this is kind of the underpinning the process of what we call personalized medicine, putting the patient in the center of research and the center of therapy. Most chemotherapies, uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, tends to be quite generic, it's aggressive, it exploits characteristics in common with all cancers. What we want to do is exploit the characteristics of a specific tumor. So we take a patient, we have, and this is an ideal world, there are tests going on to do this sort of process, but at the moment this is still an ideal world. What we would do is take a sample from that patient and split it two ways. One way, we would look at what this patient is like genetically and in terms of protein. So what is its genetic background? Does it have any mutations we should know about, etc. Then we take other samples and we grow them in the lab, into cell lines, into spheroids. We take all this information in the lab and try to work out understanding what the biology of this patient is like, what makes him special, what makes his tumor unique. And therefore we can design specialized targeted therapies against this patient. We can exploit the particular pathway is altered to see whether this patient responds better or not, to find better terms for radiotherapy, for example. And then we take it a step further because what happens a lot in cancer is that patients initially respond to therapy, like Henrietta did, and then the, the tumor comes back. It's what we call resistance. They don't respond to therapy anymore. So what we want is to go back in the lab, back to our cell lines, test the new therapies, and go back to the patient. Without doing a generic approach, we can focus on the patient. So it's really important to bring the research, cancer research from a patient to the model back to the patient. I would like to finish to remind us about the initial topic of this talk, which is Henrietta Lacks. Without knowing, Henrietta Lacks became the mother of modern biomedicine. Her cells revolutionized bi biomedical research and considering we're coming to the end of the Women's uh, History Month, it's really important to note that sometimes it's not the Nobel Prize winners that make a difference, but sometimes just patients in a lab just coming to therapy. Thank you. <laughs>